So welcome to today's Part L webinar with Eco2 Solar, E.ON and AES Sustainability Consultants. My name is Jess and I'll be hosting today's webinar along with my colleague Alison. We will be asking your questions to the panellists at 1pm, so do please send us your questions through the Q&A function throughout the webinar and we'll read out as many as we can at the end. In today's webinar, you can expect to find out more about Part L and the challenges house builders face, how house builders can achieve Part L compliance, and what needs to be done now to minimise the risk. We'll be hearing from Alex Brooks, Director at AES Sustainability Consultants, a leading techn technical consultancy that delivers value engineered solutions across house building and construction industries and Denver Rummy, Senior Business Innovation Manager at E.ON, one of the UK's leading energy providers. We'll also hear from eco Solar CEO Paul Hutchins and Commercial Di Director Ryan Nee. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Jess. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Hutchins. I'm the CEO and founder of, of eco Solar. Uh, just a few a few words about us before we start. Um, we specialise in, in solar PV and other related electrical technologies, specifically for new build housing and, and associated buildings like apartment buildings and so on. We don't really do anything else. And um, we've been doing that uh, since we started in 2007 and becoming more and more focused on those things um, as the years go on. Um, we, as you may have seen in the press, were recently partly acquired by E.ON. Um, that was a tremendous move from our perspective and a strategic move from, from E.ON uh, to move more into um, acquiring assets, I guess, in, the, um, in this particular space. Uh, we work right across the whole of the country, uh, which is quite unusual, not just for a PV provider, but also for a company working within uh, the new built housing space to actually cover the whole of mainland UK. So we have an office in Scotland, in East Kilbride, an office in the Midlands, in, um, in, in, in Kidderminster, in, um, in, in England. And we service the whole of the country from that, right from Inverness down to Plymouth, Cornwall uh, and over to, to, to Brighton and Kent, including London. Uh, we're expecting to expand that over the years. As you'll see, there's going to be increased demand, significant increased demand for what we do, amongst other things. Um, we're looking to add more offices to that and increase our reach over the next sort of two to three years. So we've been in business for 14 years. Um, we, we, we work on about a thousand plots a month across about 450 sites across the UK. Uh, we directly engage over 15 installation teams now and we've done uh, over 22 and a half thousand installations since we started on average apparently so i'm told by my commercial team we save our clients about forty thousand pounds per site um, based on the value engineering work that we do to try and make sure that uh, we do things as cost effectively as possible uh, we're, we're into making solar standard and sustainability standards so obviously if we can make it uh, cost more cost effective or cheaper for you then we'll do that uh, these are some of our clients. Uh, we work with all, all of the, the major blue chips, really, people like Barrett's, Taylor Wimpy, Bistry, Red Row, the Simmon, Bellway, Bovis, um, uh, and so on. Um, and also work with, um, that's on a preferred supplier basis or a group deal basis. We also work with some of the other nationals like Carla, for example, and some of the, some of the, the smaller uh, new up and coming companies like Kuro, for example, l &G and so on, um, Ilka Homes on, on the MMC side of things, but also um, some of the regional providers as well. So we're talking today about regulation, really. We're talking about you know, what are the government trying to do? And what's the implications for you? Well, first of all, uh, the overall policy framework is the net zero emissions by 2050. That's where everything is leading towards, and that's, that's encased in law, of course. Um, and there's a few things along the way, like the buildings mission, which is to halve energy use of all new buildings by 2030, reduce carbon reduction from them by 2035, I think it's 68% by 2030. And one of the keystone measures of this, along with the uh, ban of, of uh, fossil fuel vehicles in the early 2030s, is the future home standing in 2025 happens actually in 2024 in Scotland, where effectively they'll ban fossil fuels uh, in homes or new homes going forward, and then probably look to roll that out to existing homes with things like boiler replacements and so on. So the, the future home standard, which we're focusing on today, is, is really split into two parts. Uh, the full, full future home standard starts in 25, uh, 2025, and um, there's a, 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 a step change towards that significant one in, tw in 2022. 
um, and that's the, the the new part L of the building regulations, which is uh, providing a 30, 31% improvement over 2013, which is the last time uh, the building regs were changed in this respect. I'm um, expected to be um, to be met by improved building services, um, better fabric, and, and some technology like like a PV, maybe heat pumps, things like wastewater heat recovery, and so on. Alex will talk a bit more about that in in a moment. Um, and future home standard in full, which comes in in 2025, expected to anyway, will completely phase out all fossil fuels um, at, at, at source in homes. Um, and therefore, things like a better fabric, uh, low carbon heating systems and so on are likely to become uh, become standard heat pumps, for example. So currently um, in, in England, different in Scotland and slightly different in Wales as well, is that you know, any, any solar panels or additional measures uh, sustainability wise tend to be met by the local authority planning and energy act um, re requirements so bristol for example require 20 percent london's 35 percent of energy produced on site for renewables that re results obviously in a very pepper potted sort of look for uh, renewables and solar and so on in, in england where some local authorities specify it through planning others don't um, and it's a little bit messy in a sense um, but through the new Part L proposals, uh, we expect that, that all, all, um, all, all uh, new properties from 2022, 23 onwards will need to re meet this standard, either with PV plus some other um, technologies like wastewater heat recovery, fully gas heat recovery and fabric, or possibly heat pumps. So timeline there really is uh, this year they laid down the, the regulations, including the new SAP software. Uh, next year, the new in June, the new regulations come into force. There's a transition period of 12 months, which ends in June 2023, and in 2025, the new future home standard in full comes in. So what that means is that in June 2022, technically the new regulations will start or apply for all new buildings, all new plots. It's been done on a plot by plot basis, not on a site by site basis, but there is a, a 12 month transition period, which if you get your planning in and lodged with your, with your building regs as well before June 2022, you get a 12 month transitional arrangement, all those plots on that site um, under the old regs. Uh, from that point onwards, um, then the new regs will apply unless you've started the actual plot, which means putting in foundations, drainage or, or piling or boring specific to the plot before June 2023, in which case you get to finish that plot. Uh, you've started so you can finish. Um, it's worth noting Planning Energy Act um, is unamended, so local authorities can still define higher standards into the new, uh, new regime of, of regulations. Um, and the, the new uh, future standard, as we said before, arrives in 2025. The intention is apparently to consult in 2023, legislate in 2024 and implement that in 2025. So a fairly sort of sharp uh, period of implementation for those, which means these new regulations might be relatively short lived uh, coming in in 22, 23 and, and potentially in 2025, 26, uh, the, the full future home standard comes in. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Alex Brooks, uh, director from AES. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, hopefully I've now got control. Yeah. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, firstly, uh, yeah, I'm Alex Brooks, director from AES Sustainability Consultants. Um, big thanks to Eco2Solar for inviting me to come and speak um, to, to everyone today. Um, we've worked with Eco2 Solar for a number of years um, and, you know, successful relationship in, in value engineering schemes to essentially reduce PV, but uh, it, it, it works. So um, I will carry on if I can. So uh, Paul's touched on it, but I'll, I'll just go into a bit more detail, perhaps on the, the, the latter end of the timeline. So as Paul mentioned, we've got uh, Part L 2021 coming into force June 2022 with the 12 month um, transitional window to, to 2023. And you've got to make that plot start as Paul suggested, which is obviously the big change from when you used to put some drainage in and secure the whole scheme under an old building reg. So I, I think pretty much everyone's got their head around that and working out the phasing of sites to, to deliver that. So then as we move forward to future home standard, there's a whole um, period of uh, developing evidence base for implementation, um, testing the new SAP 11 software. Um, so we're sat on a group looking at that at the moment. Um, so that would be the SAP software used to, 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 to assess under the future home standard in 2025. Um, at the moment, all we know is it's a 75 to 80% reduction over current standards. Um, 
we've got some information of an indicative notional dwelling specification um, and and we expect it to be possibly a similar transitional period whereby you know you have a year to to transition to the future home standard so more and more will, will, will come out so in terms of part l 2021 so i'll probably start by saying um unfortunately there's still quite a lack of clarity in the industry um, around some consultations that are still um, there hasn't been a response to yet from government um, so we'll, we'll come on to those in a bit more detail so um, the, the the metrics for part l 2021 so we've got co2 so we, we've had this for a long time so this is your der ter and your percentage um, co2 reduction over building regulations so that's a 31 percent aggregate improvement over part l um, uh, current part l 2013 um, so that'll be shown in the same way, DERTR and your percentage um, carbon reduction over building regulations. A new one is primary energy. So this takes into account the um, efficiency of dwellings, heating system, as well as upstream energy uses, um, fuel transportation and conversion. Um, it's been brought in a line a alongside carbon as the, the grid becomes decarbonized in the future. We will talk more and more about the energy, you know, primary energy use in a home rather than its carbon emissions. Um, so that that um, has been brought in alongside the consultation I mentioned is the fabric energy efficiency. So in the original future homes consultation, the fabric energy efficiency standard or fees, as, as most will know it, was was going to be removed. Um, there was quite a lot of backlash saying, well, hang on, why are you, why are you pushing us down a low temperature heating solution and, and not driving the fabric? Because surely the two go go together, which they do. Um, so that. That came out in a separate consultation, um, actually bolted onto an existing buildings consultation, which we still haven't had response to. I'll, I'll come on to what the what they're looking at in the in the fees um, in the next slide, um, and then finally we've got the minimum an update to the minimum standards for fabric and fixed building services. So there's um, updated minimum U value. So for example, the external wall minimum backstop value is now 0.26, and it used to be 0.3. So Fabric is key to any potential solution. So um, the, the, the text on the left is a direct copy from the, from the consultation I mentioned earlier. So um, for part of 2021, we, government, are implementing uh, option two, 31% uplift. Um, the fabric specification to be used in notional dwelling um, will be used, and they're looking at two, two, two options, essentially. So option one, and in bold in the consultation, was government's preferred approach, is to set fees at the full fabric specification um, in table 6.3, which you can see to the right hand side. Um, and option two is to set the same fees using the same table, but to apply um, basically multiply this target by 1.15. So it effectively gives you a 15% comfort factor, if you like. Um, we, and I know most developers have been working on the assumption that it will be option one because it's in bold that it's government preferred option and, and we strongly expect that to happen. Now, the key bit here is it's still a recipe. So you can really improve one element and relax others. So although there's a, it's quite a stringent set of values, you don't have to build exactly to each one. So you could really improve your windows and, and floor and air permeability and relax your wall. So it's not to say you don't have the same recipe approach. It just makes it that little bit harder. So looking at um, looking at the values that, that's in the in the fee consultation um, and obviously government's preferred solution. So walls at 0.18. So that's a, a hundred mil cavity um, looking at traditional build hundred mil cavity with a with a, a PIR type full fill insulation or a 150 cavity with a with a full fill insulation, um, various timber frame MMC solutions, floors at 0.13 again, various ways. So ground bearing floor slab, beam and block, insulated floor systems, there's loads of solutions out there to deliver a 0.13 floor. Roof at 0.11. Um, so again, this is the, the average value for the roof. So um, it's, it's a 400 mil minimum wall loft insulation, which I'm sure many of you do already. already. Um, we feel sloping ceilings may need to, to improve and we're seeing it through the modeling that they probably will from 0.2 or 0.22, whatever you build at the moment to, to meet the aggregate value that, that, that will have to come down. Um, and it obviously affects room and roof house types. Windows at 1.2, so U value is achievable with a double glazed unit. Um, strongly advised, check G values, um, you know, cost of getting different G values and how that affects overheating, how it balances your SAP calculation, taking the, the benefit of solar gain. Um, 
air permeability at five. So five is very much the industry average. Um, and obviously you have to test every plot. Don't see that being a huge issue, but developers may reduce that from five to get an inverted column as a free gain, but must balance that with your ventilation strategy and on site, you know, finishing and being able to achieve anything lower than five. Um, thermal bridging. So the accredited construction details um, are being removed. Um, we strongly urge you to calculate bridges, work with manufacturers to calculate bridges. We calculate side values. Um, it's an absolute no brainer to, to gain the benefit to do that. Um, and, and also look at thermally broken lintels as a way of helping you to achieve that fees. So as I mentioned, I've outlined because I'm sure you can appreciate there's a huge, there's lots of different ways to look at all these elements. Um, it's still a recipe. You can still balance things off against each other and, and find what, what's, what, what works best for your business. You know, everyone's starting from different starting points in terms of construction type or, or cavity thickness, et cetera. So once, you know, we feel that, that the important bit is to fix your fabric um, and that's the base in which we then build from to achieve the, the 31%. So for the first time, you know, appreciate that a lot of this technology is already out there, but this 31% improvement is really now pushing us out to look at more technology. So, you know, the majority of developments would be on gas, uh, you know, gas combis or gas system boilers with, with, a, with a hot water cylinder. And, and that's pretty much it. I'm talking um, sort of a high level position, but now we're looking at all sorts. We've got, you know, air source heat pumps, hot water heat pumps, um, you know, clever radiant panel heaters with, with, with smart controls. And there's all sorts, all sorts of stuff to get to go into the mix now. So um, again, I could cover various options. I'm probably just going to touch on the, the common ones we're seeing, you know, pull through from, from what developers are looking at. And, and that primarily is two options. So it's gas plus bolt-on technologies to achieve, um, obviously building from your fabric that meets the fee standard, or it's going straight to a heat pump. So the gas solution first. So many are looking at adding in um, uh, a wastewater heat recovery pipe. So um, I'll play the video. Um, basically takes the, the, the heat from a shower, um, the, the mains incoming water, um, picks up the heat from within the within a pipe with a pipe within a pipe and goes back to the the, the uh, boiler and showers as to work as hard to to preheat that water. Um, design considerations would be enlarged soil and vent stack, so kitchen design layouts, you know, ground floor layouts in general where the pipe comes down. You do need a, a, a larger uh, boxing. Flue gas heat recovery, so much in the same way as wastewater, the, you're burning hot flue gases, there's plate heat exchangers, which takes the heat from those gases and recirculates it into the heating system to, to gain benefit. Again, um, design considerations, it's um, a box that sits on top of a boiler. There's obviously different manufacturers out there. So some of them look different and all integral and, and, and obviously you have to work with your, your heating uh, supplier and designer with that. But again, design considerations into you know, the standard house we look at. You know, if you can't go in a utility or garage, you're in cupboards and have you got the height space? So you need to be aware of that one. And then finally, it's PV top up. So again, on the modeling we've done, it, it looks like pretty much PV to, to all units. Um, so it depends on, on the, the new SAP. Um, the new SAP is, is done on floor area, how much PV is in the notional dwelling. So it depends on the, on the size of the property. Um, Thing to mention here is around flats. So where you would used to have a, a PV to landlord supply and the EPC, the, the, the flats EPC would show the benefit of PV that no longer shows on the EPC. So you can still claim the benefit for building regs approval. So, you know, getting your saps to work, but when you sell the flat to, to an occupant, it isn't shown on their EPC as, as they are getting it, then you know, it doesn't show they're getting a benefit from PV. So if you want them to see that, it would mean you know, multiple inverters to, to do that. Um, so that's something to be aware of. So how does that sort of stack up, that potential solution? Well, um, if you take a two-story, four-bed detached property, so 120 metres squared, bath with an ensuite, um, traditionally built um, and modelled in the BRE ISAP beta software. So taking here the, the notional dwelling, essentially, so the, the table 6.3, the fees uh, consultation table, so a 0.18 wall, so 150 cavity or, or you know, a, a timber frame or whatever it is to suit, um, floor 0.13, roof 1.1, 1, 1, 1. 1.2 window. So what I went through earlier with um, 
all calculated linear, linear thermal bridging and a thermally broken lintel, a decentralized MEV system, air tightness at five, a gas boiler, two wastewater heat recovery units, and we require uh, 14 300 watt panels to, to gain our pass. So looking over to the table on the right, we've got our, at the top, we've got our dwelling primary energy rate, which is kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. Uh, so we've got our dwelling, we've got our, our, um, our dwelling rate and our target rate. So you can see we're within that. Below is our dwelling emission rate, so the, the old DERTER. And then we've got our fees. Um, as I mentioned, the government looking two options. So the, the target fee one is the, the option one, more stringent target, and target fee two is the lesser stuff. So you can see we're passing all. So it's a we're passing building regs by nearly three percent carbon, nearly one percent primary energy, and three and a bit percent fees. So just to show that flexibility, this is a two-story, three-bed and semi property. Um, and the, 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 the specifications are the same, albeit the wall is relaxed to a, to a 125 or, or, or whatever system to suit to, to achieve a 0.21 wall. Um, and, and it's got the same spec, but it's got a combi boiler, not a system boiler. It's got one wastewater rather than two, and it's obviously got far less PV. It's got six 300 watt panels. And, and looking across again at our results, we've got a uh, 1.52 carbon pass, uh, primary energy pass, and our fees pass. So you can see, you know, stressing the point there, there is design flexibility there that you you, you know you can you can look at and investigate. Uh, last example um, is going back to our four bed detached property where we've um, removed the bolt ons. So it's the same fabric specification. We've taken out wastewater heat recovery. We've taken off all the PV and we've put input an air source heat pump. Um, and you can see, uh, you can just see how, how, how it works in the new SAPs. Of, in the new SAP. So we've got a 55% DER TER pass. So we're absolutely smashing uh, the new building regs. We've got a 10% primary energy pass and we've got a slightly enlarged fees pass due to how the, 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 the hot water works and it affects the fee standard. So um, it, it, it is interesting how, how, how that, that comes through and, and clearly pushes sort of government intention of, of where, they, uh, where they want you to go. So uh, some other factors that are, you, you really need to be thinking about now. Um, so firstly, um, Paul mentioned it, local authorities. So they, 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 they still have the ability to ask for additional standards. So what, what does that do to your Part L 2021 solution? So if, if your solution is gas and PV, um, or it's a heat pump, you need to, to work out on sites where you're already there or looking at new sites, how is the local authority policy worded? Will they change their local plan? Are they looking at climate change emergencies? Um, you know, policy wording could say 20% over Part L 2013, or it could say 20% over the building regulations of that time. So you need to be really clear on what the policy says so you can implement a strategy. So as I said, if renewables are used to meet if, if renewables are being used to meet regs, are you going to have enough space to, to, to increase that to meet a planning requirement? Um, if not, you may need to go to heat pumps or, or another solution to look at local authority requirements. Um, and and I, just as I sort of showed earlier in terms of technology, looking at design considerations. So um, I think most people probably understand how a heat pump works now because we've all had to, to, to learn pretty quickly. So. Um, heat pump obviously takes the air from outside. Using electricity, it compresses the air and releases it at a higher temperature. Um, so in terms of design considerations, obviously you need the external space. I'm sure lots of you already looked at this. You need to implement, you need to have a hot water cylinder, so smaller units, you define the space, um, and they're low temp heat emitters, so larger rads or, or underfloor heating. Uh, the next part, as you can tell, there's, there's lots of info here. So. Um, Please ask questions if you want any more detail on this, but I, I can't go into too much detail on everything. So um, in terms of the overheating consultation, so the overheating will, will be released as its own approved document. So as, we, as it stands today, SAP um, in its current format does look at overheating in, in, in one of the criteria of, of SAP. It's quite a, let's say, woolly assessment. It very rarely flags fails. It's probably not fit for purpose. So hence why they're looking at an approved um, document of its own for overheating. Um, and this is because we've got obviously a warming climate, we've got um, you know, indoor air quality issues, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, it is important and they are looking at it. So there's, there's two, essentially two um, approaches they're looking at. 
One is a simplified methodology. So it, it distinguishes between two areas, Greater London, where they deem it's a significant risk, and remaining England, where they deem it to be a moderate risk. Not sure why central Manchester is any different to central um, London, but there we go. Um, and, and they fall into two categories within those two um, areas. So group A is um, more than two glazed elements and ventilation on opposite sides. So essentially you can open windows on both sides. This applies to houses and, and some flats. And group B is where you've got less than two glazed elements um, and you don't have the ability to, to have openings on both sides. So that applies to most, most flats and common areas. So we've done quite a lot of analysis looking at the simplified methodology. Um, and at the moment, we are seeing quite a few issues where you get fails in some of those categories. Um, we've had some meetings with government and apparently there is going to be some changes to the simplified methodology. So again, like the fees consultation, we just have to wait at the moment, unfortunately. The second option um, is dynamic simulation modelling. So this is using um, SIBC TM59 to do a full dynamic simulation model of a, of a house room by room. So looking at the, the factors for living room, kitchen and, and habitable rooms. Um, we're seeing some developers take a view that you almost do this as a, a type approval situation. So if you have standard house types, obviously this is possible um, and you model them to all the weather files, you know, where you build and you have it almost as a house type A does not overheat because we have a dynamic simulation model that sits in the background of, you know, all our information, just like you'd have a, a kitchen design, to be honest. Um, so that's, that's something we're seeing. So again, um, we're, we're, we're keeping an eye on this and, and, and reporting back at, at, as and when we can and we find out more. Just trying to get to the next slide. So as built checks, so again, hopefully you're very aware of this one, again, because of all the stuff going on with carbon and fees and, and all the stuff developers are having to think about, you know, I appreciate there's space standards and all sorts of things going on. There's also these as built checks. So, um, this is to improve the, the, the performance gap. So homeowners will receive their building regulations, part L England or Braille report. This will show exactly what your SAP assessor has input into a SAP to create that EPC. So it has to be, you have to have confidence that what's going in there is correct and legitimate because at the end of the day, it will go to the occupant for them to see. So you'll see taking PV as an example, you'll see that the, the amount, the roof pitch, the uh, orientation. So all that information has to be has to be correct. The second part where I think there's huge amounts of issues is the photographic evidence. So the the uh, on the right hand side of the, the screen there is, is is Appendix B taken from the draft Part L uh, document. So developers will for, for 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 CML will have to provide photographs on every single plot on every single development under the new Part L. And those photos need to essentially tick off everything numbered there and they need to be labeled that way. So for instance, plot one at whatever site will have photo 1A, which will be ground floor perimeter edge insulation. And we'll have a photo that shows the correct perimeter edge insulation is installed. So I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but around the issues, because I'm sure you can all think of hundreds, but it's so important that these photos are taking at the right time before screens laid, you know, everything's closed up where you can't see anything because it potentially will affect your CML. So if you haven't thought about this yet, I urge you to really think about how, how your company will implement this and, and um, make it as streamlined as possible. And last slide. So um, what's still to be determined? What do we still need to know? So I obviously mentioned it. So the key bits are government's response to the fees consultation. This will allow us to set our, this will allow you to set, set your fabric. So your base fabric specification for your developments from which you then build off to achieve your 31%. We desperately need the approved SAP 10 software, but it's all currently beta software. So there's no one's got proper software available yet. It's all beta software, whether it's Elmhurst, Stroma or, or the BREI SAP software. Um, so all, you know, all the modeling is subject to change. Um, and finally, the government response to the overheating consultation, um, because the results of this will need to be factored into your house type design, you know, speaking to your supply chain around window openings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I appreciate there's a lot, a lot there to take in. So um, look forward to, to, to getting your questions. And I'll now hand over to Denver from E.ON. 
Thank you, Alex. I'll just request control. Um, yeah, thanks, Alex. And thanks to Paul and Ryan for asking me along today. Um, my name is Denver Romney and I work in Eon Group Innovation, um, specifically in the area of energy communities and networks. You may know that Eon don't own distribution networks in the UK, but with a large are developing innovative solutions in this area. So following on from some of what Paul and Alex have um, spoken about so far today, it's clear that Part L and further, further regulation will mean that more and more PV arrays and heat pumps will be installed and connected uh, in England's homes, which is critical in order for our UK housing stock to have a much lower carbon footprint than in the past. Having an understanding of the impact that these technologies will have on the grid that supplies them is really important for you as your future developments will connect to distribution networks that will have to add significant capacity over the next decade in order to enable our electrified low carbon future. The UK's distribution networks have been designed and built to supply homes that have been mainly heated by fossil fuel burning boilers, while distributed generation in the form of technologies such as rooftop PV arrays has only relatively recently been a part of our energy picture. So what do PV arrays and heat pumps mean for the grid? Firstly, the cables, transformers, the substations, et cetera, all of these things that make up the network supplying these homes and businesses around the UK, they've got limited capacities according to what they were designed to supply and indeed how much of that capacity has already been taken up. So if new developments exceed the remaining capacity of the network, where they're connecting, there's a problem. Heat pumps obviously increase the load of a site as the energy required when they run must be added to the base load of the homes for lighting and sockets and all those other, other, other things that we're used to in the home. The increase can be considerable as DNOs have traditionally added the total theoretical load of the heat pump system which includes any backup heaters, et cetera, all on top. And they don't usually apply any diversity to that. So as heat pumps, as well as EV chargers become standard in future, you can see how, how the design loads for developments will increase considerably. PV arrays too pose a challenge to distribution networks as the expert of export of energy from the site can cause problems for the DNOs. Each development will have a fixed capacity for export, which must be less than the kilowatt peak of the combined PV across the development. I believe that Eco2 Solar are coming across sites already in Scotland where, where the export capacity is a problem. Let's look at the picture in the UK and the scale of the challenge to DNOs. Government is providing policy to address climate change. They're also providing funding in many areas to stimulate a shift to low carbon technologies. However, the success of this policy and the money backing it will depend on the supply of energy to power heat pumps and electric vehicle chargers, and also the ability of the networks to enable the connection of distributed generation, which can actually offset our reliance on traditional centralized generation. Today, according to our research, a third of DNO substations have less than 30% spare capacity. That's today on step one of our low carbon journey. So it's clear that DNOs will have to significantly increase capacity to meet a much greater demand. But here's some further insight from around the UK. In England, we'll be rolling out an ambitious decarbonisation plan. And this will mean thousands of heat pumps, EV chargers, and various forms of distributed generation, all connected to the grid. The estimated cost to upgrade the network to cope with all of these technologies will be circa £1 billion. In truth, the cost isn't, isn't actually the biggest problem here. It's the ability of the network operator to rapidly increase capacity with upgrades in such a short period of time. But we have solutions that can ease that burden. And it's a similar picture throughout the length and breadth of the UK where DNOs operate networks which weren't designed for, designed for the loads, which must be connected in the coming years. However, there are solutions to many of these challenge, challenges, which includes smartifying the networks 
and deferring the need for many of these upgrades by making more of the existing capacity. And that's where we come in. Along with Eco2 Solar, as well as the DNO SPEN and the IDNO energy assets involved on the site, EON have deployed a solution which has enabled developers to proceed with the development and in doing so mitigated a very scary network upgrade fee. As you can see on the right, sufficient capacity wasn't available to supply all three substations with their homes connected. And in this case, both import and export capacities on the network are constrained. We've deployed our dynamic solution to enable the PV arrays to be connected, but critically ensuring that the export through the substation will not exceed the capacity allowed by the DNO. So basically what, uh, what we're doing on this development is we're monitoring the load live at the substation, both for import and export. And when necessary, we will intervene with the PV arrays to tweak down uh, generation if and when it's needed. It's really there as an insurance policy, but the DNO needs this to enable the connection. And we can do the same with import limitation for heat pumps and EV chargers, et cetera. Again, we're still monitoring the loads for import and export at the substation. And in doing so, we can anticipate any, any peak load conditions and basically make sure that they don't occur. So what we're doing is actually enabling developers to start building. It's fine if, if you consider that your adequate electrical capacity, you've got it, it's fine, fair enough. You can start, start building, you can build out your, your, your development, there's no blockers there. But more and more, you will start to come across sites where the network is constrained, the DNO hasn't, hasn't got an upgrade that's planned right now. And you're gonna to have to make some, some, some tough decisions. So if it's the fact that the capacity isn't there, you can basically decide to wait, put, possibly build some homes in the interim period, and then hope that the network upgrade can be arranged as soon as, soon as possible. A little bit of insight there is across Europe, the average time to plan and execute an infrastructure upgrade is between seven and 10 years. Now those are for planned upgrades. At times DNOs can arrange quicker upgrades, but as you can imagine, with the increase in workload that they're, they're gonna have, that might be, 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 be quite tough on them. We have a solution which will enable you to start building and keep on building while we make the most of the existing capacity. Then when the upgrade comes, you will have been building up to it and then you can complete. In the future, things are gonna get a little bit more, more interesting with Ofgem's direction of travel. They're very much keen on a flexibility first approach for distribution network operators. So basically rather putting more and more copper um, in the ground and overhead, make the most of the existing networks and deploy active network management and where we can, we can um, supply solutions to new build developments, we can actually steer those loads as I've articulated earlier. So basically what will, will happen is the DNO will be in a position to balance the generation consumption of energy across, across their local networks. And this may mitigate or at least defer a lot of these infrastructure upgrades. So I'm going to pass on to Ryan Mee of Eco2 Solar. I hope that's been interesting. Thanks, Denver. Welcome, everybody. Um, just going to cover some of the challenges that um, we see are coming ahead. Um, and I guess a lot of it is borne by our experience with um, working with customers in Scotland. So Scotland moved to um, a different change in regulations back in 2015. And we've learned a lot over the years, the challenges they've faced, particularly around the grid uh, restriction capacities. But Scotland um, adopted a similar approach to what we believe will happen in England and speaking with grid deal customers on what their uh, proposed um, method of achieving Partel, it seems that around 80% or so will go down the fabric improvement, wastewater, flue gas and PV solution to achieve part L compliance. And in terms of the impact on that, as Alex has already um, discussed, 
we're looking on average around a two to two and a half kilowatt PV system, obviously bigger systems on the larger house types, smaller ones on the smaller house types, because it's based on the, um, the floor area. Um, the same with flats, different calculations that um, Alex can help you with. We're also um, waiting for SAP to confirm, you know, is this gonna be slightly better or slightly worse when you get the final version? Um, but over and above all of those uh, challenges that we're already aware of, uh, based on the feedback of implementation, uh, the biggest problem that we see coming down the line is this uh, huge upwards cliff, which I'll, um, I'll show for you in, in visible terms. So just to sort of explain this slide, um, you've got the number of houses built in England. Important to say that this is just England, not Scotland or Wales. So let's say there's 180 odd ha thousand houses built each year, maybe more, but that would only make the numbers worse. So we'll just, we'll just assume we build at the same levels. Currently, um, because it's uh, local planning require carbon reduction targets in certain areas, um, we believe that around 10% of houses in England have solar PV systems on to meet those local requirements. So just under 18,000 houses at the moment per year have solar PV systems on. What we believe is going to be the case and feedback from the volume developers on how they're going to approach this is that we've got the uh, implementation next year uh, from June of the new regulations. And it seems that the overwhelming majority uh, will look to uh, secure the 2013 regs and build as many foundations, start as many plots as they possibly can to try and mitigate that extra cost. Um, there's some medium and smaller developers that don't have the land bank or the working capital to be able to do that. So there will, there will we see um, a slight increase next year when some of those plots start to hit those new regulations. So we've assumed around a 15% instead of a 10% impact. So we're already increasing by 50% from this year to next year, which is you know, significant in anybody's opinion, but more than achievable. Where it really gets very interesting is when we fall into 2023, when the transitional period finishes because you get 12 months to start those plots and, and uh, start work and complete the plots. Um, and then towards the end of 2023, when that transitional period finishes, then we're into the new Part L regs. So assuming that 30% of the houses of the year uh, under the new regulations with PV systems on, you can see that we're looking at a significant jump then from 2023 and later in 2023 times three of what we are currently installing in England um, across the board. When you then get into 2024, when we're at full implementation and 80% of houses are going down the gas and PV route to compliance, a huge jump from where we are now times eight, the number of houses and the number of installations that are going in every year. So that might sound quite scary, um, but from our perspective and your perspective, it should be even more scary when you look at the, the detail of the implementation and the time scale of this. If everybody builds out as many plots as they can um, to get the current regulations, and then everything starts to really hit towards quarter three, quarter four um, of 2023 with the new regulations, it's not a gradual curve, as you saw on the first the slide previously. It is a big cliff and a big sharp spike. So if you just break down those numbers, this is just breaking it down into quarters now. It's a 30% increase in the volume of houses needing PV basically every three months, which is significant until you get to the end of 2023. And then almost overnight, starting in January and the first quarter of 2024, it's times three from the end of 2023. So you can imagine um, how that would look from a stock perspective, labor perspective, resource perspective, grid connection, grid capacity perspective. It's almost like imagining, you know, you don't have to put windows in houses for the next 18 months. And then all of a sudden, once everybody is not skilled up and ready to hit that, then a window is needed in every single house. You can imagine the challenges that, that that's gonna bring with it. To put it into perspective as well, 
If you look at quarter one of 2024, with 80% of those houses needing PV, that's double the number of installations that are going in at the moment, just in a quarter compared to the whole year in 2021. So a huge, huge jump and spike, all compounded by this um, rush to try to snag the 2013 regs and then create a very big challenge for the supply chain and the national grid to try to overcome. So our advice and what we propose that people should do to avoid a significant amount of pain is to essentially get your designs done now. Uh, although it sounds like we've got you know, 12 months to, to plan this, uh, we've already been doing this on our group deals with customers to look at their house types. Obviously, we need to check first and foremost that the roof elevations will fit the systems that are needed for compliance. There's already challenges that have been shown with you know, room in the roofs, with velux windows, with eyebrows, with gables, with dormers, it limits the space that you can achieve uh, the PV systems on. We're looking at maybe putting PV on both elevations or sometimes three elevations to get compliance. But at least getting the designs done very, very early on at least gives us some uh, red flags on what will be the challenges. And some developers are already looking at tweaking their house types and their designs to make them more PV friendly. Uh, the DNO considerations will be significant. So again, if you consider the DNO, when we look to connect any PV system on a new build housing development, we have to seek prior approval from the local operator. They can take, at the moment, up to three months to turn around and give you approval. And you're not allowed to commission that plot until the grid has given you approval. So you imagine if we're going from 300 um, applications a year across England to the grid at the moment, that could go up to two and a half thousand applications a year by the time these regulations really kick in. So it's not just the supply chain that people might consider stock resource capacity. It's also, you know, how are the grid going to respond to a massive influx of applications with people wanting to connect mini power stations uh, to the grid? And that's the same with, you know, PV or air source heat pumps. So what we're advocating and what we're encouraging customers to do is to begin trials on site. As with anything, don't go from a standing start to full pelt um, within you know, the first six months, it would just not happen. So start on site, begin trials, look at being early adopters. Don't push houses back um, to later on in the year. We've already seen a couple of examples of this um, where people were going to be putting in PV panels on developments where local planners required it. Uh, to get the local planning and act um, conditions they've pushed them back now to try to put those plots through under the future building regs but there's a huge risk there as alex alluded to earlier that the local planners may still ask for over and above building regulations and if people do that it will compound the problem it will add more plots to be delivered um, and you may find that you run out of plots to achieve those targets and roofs to deliver and not get compliance. So the biggest thing really from our perspective is, is encouraging everybody is to go early and phase the implementation. Uh, although PV isn't a new technology, it is to some, and doing it on, on such a scale that it's on every single house, every single roof, um, can't just happen overnight. It needs to be adopted smoothly and phased rather than pushing, pushing it back. And then, you know, every developer then does it right at the end of 2023 and then finds that the supply chain hasn't been uh, invested in and built up enough. And then there's a you know, significant amount of pain. The key thing to um, achieve these challenges ahead is to use a specialist such as ourselves, somebody that just does this day in, day out. So managing the stock, managing the supply chain, you can see the challenges in the volume that's going to be needed. Um, you know, the same amount, double the amount in a quarter in the future as to the whole year at the moment. We have a model where we're able to cover um, the UK, Scotland, England and Wales nationally, just delivering new build solar installations. And we feel that we're very efficient um, at delivering those systems. There aren't that many companies like that, like us. So if you break that down into you know, roofing contractors, electrical contractors that are going to be trying to deliver this for you. 
you won't get the same efficiencies and you won't get the the details um, that you do from a specialist the biggest one of those being the dno application as i as i explained earlier and it's really a, a snapshot as to what happened in Scotland, where solar is on 80% of the houses, has been for the last three years since the regulations filtered through. We saw some customers uh, placing orders with roofing contractors, electrical contractors that don't understand the whole turnkey process. They didn't do applications to the grid, they left that to the customers and they still do now. Um, and then you find that you come up against um, challenges when a CML is required on a plot and then the customer finds that nobody's seek uh, prior approval to the grid and it led to three to four months delays on CMLs in quite a number of cases. So if you take Scotland as a, you know, 15% of the houses delivered compared to England, everybody's moved towards um, specialists because of the challenges, as Denver alluded to, um, with the capacity of the grid. You can imagine the, the scale of that capacity constraint that's going to happen very quickly in England with the bigger numbers in that's going to come through. So a specialist will obviously be fully aware of uh, how to design a heat pump and a PV system correctly. If it's all that they do, they'll be aware of future panel efficiencies that are coming through, which will enable you to get compliance on some of the trickier house types. And imagine that the, the levels of customer service that are going to be required, um, PV on 10% of the houses, we already see a significant number of inquiries coming through from homeowners moving into houses where we've installed the systems on wanting to know how it works how do i apply for my export bonus what is an inverter what do i need to do if that's on every single plot or 80 percent of the plots you can imagine the volume of stuff that's going to be coming through to your uh, sales and marketing teams or customer service teams yeah, a roofing contractor or a non-specialist is not going to be able to help you out to deal with those customers so this is my um, final slide, really, just to show you um, we're at, at a bit of a, a crossroads, a um, bit of a fork in the road. So the, the top one is where we believe that we may be going to. Unfortunately, if everybody adopts the, you know, push it back until we really, really have to do it in late 2023, the top one is a supply chain manager's nightmare, if you ask them, because that essentially is going to be demand exceeding supply and whenever you get demand exceeding supply it never turns out well it results in higher cost lower quality less choice of the products and the installer more stress um, delays when things haven't been designed correctly or the grid hasn't been um, pre-warmed of uh, developments stock shortages cash flow issues if uh, installers or roofers or electricians are asked to buy this volume of PV panels and inverters, you know, four months before they're installing and then getting paid for it, that will have its implications, which will probably come back to the developers. Um, and also potential switches at the last minute where people assume that they can do PV and they find that they can't get an installer or they can't get stock. Um, and then they inevitably then have to switch to potentially air source or other measures halfway through a site to get compliance is all negative as far as you can see from that scenario um, and I guess it's it's comparing the risk of saving what you believe to be the extra cost of those plots in 2022 and 2023 versus the potential costs and increases of the pain that will come with the the path that we seem to be taking on the top if we go to the bottom slide this is what could happen um, which is all about early adoption, not putting everything back until 2023 when the, the regs fully kick in, gearing up the supply chain, allowing the supply chain to invest in labour, resource, stock, warehouses, everything that comes with you know, needing to scale to this level of volume. And with it will inevitably come a smoother transition. Um, if you imagine, you know, the procurement teams and the commercial teams have all felt a lot of pain from shortages of supply, price increases on everything from blocks to steel to timber to copper. You can see from the top one there that is going to be a permanent pain and a permanent issue from a PV perspective if everything is pushed back in, in an attempt to try and save cost on you know, plots for the sake of 12 months. 
So my message really is to tie your resource down. There potentially won't be enough installers to go around if we, if we hit the top trajectory. There won't be enough um, panels or stock availability. People will inevitably stop taking orders at a certain degree. Um, and although we'd love to deliver every single house with every single PV system when these regs kick in, we just physically won't be able to do it. So get your designs done now. Get your installer and your resource tied down into a firm agreement to try and lock in service design um, cost to a certain degree so that you know, you're working in partnerships with somebody like us and that's the best way that um, we're going to work together to try and make this as smooth a transition as we possibly can. And that's it from me. I'll just hand you back now to Jess and uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, that was all really good. And thank you for everyone um, for speaking today. So what we're going to do now is Alison and I are just going to fire over some questions to you all. Um, and... I guess you can just fight amongst yourselves to uh, answer as many as we can. If we can't answer um, all the questions, um, we will be sending out um, some documents to everyone just with all the um, questions and, and answers. Uh, so yes, there, there, are, there, are some, there, are, there are some questions in the um, in the chat as well as in the Q&A. I'm sure you've seen that. Yeah, I think Alison's picked them up, haven't you? So do you want to fire away with uh, the first question, Alison? Yep, so um, we've got one from um, Oliver, I think. Um, he asks, will the regs allow more than four kilowatts of PV per roof? That, that's quite a straightforward one, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, there you go. If it can fit on the roof, you can have as much as you like. <laughs> yeah. And I just caveat that with... <clears throat> Network capacity yeah. permitting. Yes. The next one we have as well, um, which I think I can't see it probably is from Steve. Um, are the NHBC, BCA, and AES looking at a cloud based solution for photographic evidence? So, yeah, I mean, there's this subject is coming up a lot. Um, there's, there's, there's not a lot of detail around it yet. So, as, as we understand, the photographic evidence comes from site to the energy assessor to review that it meets the, the certain, you know, against the, the appendix B I showed earlier, and then is uploaded to building control for them to sign off and just like, a you know, to, to get CML. Um, I don't want to say too much, but yeah, we're, we're, looking, at, we're looking at something at the moment. Um, which obviously we, we need to know what, what government want us to do before we can actually fix anything. I'm aware, um, so Elmhurst, who are one of the biggest SAP providers, or if not the biggest, um, are looking at various bits and pieces. And we're, we're sat in a couple of working groups about exactly how that process will work. So unfortunately, like a lot of stuff at the moment, it's uh, awaiting more clarity from government. That's great. I think we've got another one from Steve as well. How do you perceive PV working on large houses or homes with rooms in the roof? In your opinion, is there an optimum square footage before a HSP has become more viable? Yeah, it's all about getting to look at those room in the roofs and um, yeah, tricky roof spaces. Um, so <clears throat> the, the ability really to look at the specific house type and to work out you know the space um, available it doesn't always come down to the square footage of roof area because the obstacles might not be where you want them to be to fit a pv panel so you have to do that detailed design on that house type and then that will tell you from your target where somebody like alex and the team would give you that you need for compliance you know it may need five kilowatts we would then look at maybe using both elevations and then that would tell us what size PV panel we'd need to install to achieve the output. Um, so that, that's the only way really you can do it without using some you know, rough assumptions on square meterage. Uh, I think we've got another one from Oliver as well. Can the GSE integration solution help with more power per square meter? 
It's um well that that's just something that you know we we're, we're not a um, manufacturer we're an installer so we will look at every single house type for people that are wanting to partner with us on this and we would just select the most appropriate um, system panel output to achieve the targets that those houses need. I think we've got another one for you here, Ryan. It says, Ryan, what size panels are now available on the market to help us achieve a PV solution on tighter units? Yeah, it is moving to higher output panels. So the, the, the sort of output that we're working with at the moment is around 340 watts, um, and that's moved on from 270 watts previously. Um, you can source a 450 watt panel if you really need to. But inevitably, the bigger the panel output, the bigger the footprint of the panel. And with that comes quite a significant um, increase in cost. So what we've done for some developers is to look at, say, 10 house types. Um, and we would look to use, um, you know, a 340 watt panel on 80% of the houses if that fits and gives you what you need. And then some of the big house types, we look at using other higher output panels. Um, if that's what's required. But again, it comes down to the individual design on the house types and seeing what will fit and what's available, obviously, for 12, 18 months. And this will, this will move on anyway as, as we progress slowly. So what we do now will have to change as we get closer to implementation with higher output panels continuing to come out. Another one, how can we fix in, de in designs for PV without the final SAP software? Are we comfortable having designs produced on draft software? Would you know? Um, well, probably going to say the same thing. Um, I think, yeah, I think broadly speaking, yes, we know that certain units are going to need um, P, you know, going to need a fair quantity of PV to actually say between it's six, seven, eight, nine, ten panels. I would still be ner a bit nervous to say yes, that's for sure because you know we've been here before with beta software. It's always subject to change, um, so I, I would still be uh, a little nervous in, in fixing designs for sure until we get the final software. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know if Ryan's going to say the same thing or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly the same. <laughs> um, we've got one from Jason. So when is the part R and part F documents being released by the government? So uh, we understand it's um, it, it is not written down anywhere, but just in various meetings and, and, and what have you, that it's expected in December. So much, much later than we had hoped. Um, but yeah, in December, we're hoping to have fees consultation response and, and the, obviously the SAP software because they need the fees consultation response from government until they can finalise their SAP software. So that's, that's really what's holding everything up. I think we've got another one for you as well, Alex. Um, to achieve Part L regulations, have AES and a cost comparison between use of PV and air source heat pump solutions taken into account required building fabric changes, WWHR, et cetera. Is PV or air source heat pumps the most economical solution? Um, okay, yeah, so I mean, the, so when the, when the consultation was released, the government did release um, in their impact assessment some figures as to what it will cost a developer to, 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 to go for um, the 31% improvement. Um, and I think, I mean, don't quote me on this, I haven't got them in front of me, but very roughly there was sort of 4,000 for a heat pump solution and 2,500 for, for a gas solution. Um, but they didn't include, obviously, because fees was going to be removed from the original consultation, they didn't include the fee costs. Um, so uh, since then, it's moved on anyway. So we've done, you know, huge amounts of modelling for various developers looking at different wall thicknesses, different technologies with gas and PV, with air source heat pumps and, you know, you name it, we've looked at it. Um, and I think hopefully everyone will agree that the, the, the more cost effective way of doing it is gas, bolt-ons and PV. Um, at the moment, air source heat pumps with the you know, additional kit and, and cylinders, et cetera, and the installation, larger rads does, does make it more expensive. Um, we've got another one. So why can't we achieve future home standard 75% carbon reduction 
now when the Code for Sustainable Home Standard, which came into use in 2007, confirmed all new dwellings would be zero carbon by 2016? I'll pick that one up. Um, sadly, um, David Cameron and George Osborne, if you remember them from the dim and distant past, uh, basically cancelled the, the Code for Sustainable Homes and Zero Garden Homes um, project back in 2015 when we were sort of nine tenths of the way into it. Um, so that's all they effectively did was rolled the building regulations back to 2013. So building one of the reasons it's so um, there's such a fast catch up now for 2022, 23, and then 2025 is because we moved backwards. So so between 2010 and 2013, I think they they improved um, the CO2 efficiency by about six percent or something. Um, and that, now we're playing catch up effectively of, of you know sort of between 10 and 15 years worth of required regulations to get us towards net zero. So unfortunately, zero carbon homes went away six years ago. Um, and, and we're right, you know, we, we should be dealing, we should be building zero carbon homes now if you would have, we'd have kept those standards. So we're, we're playing catch up and by the time we get to 2025, hopefully we'll be uh, there or thereabouts. Uh, we've got another one from Fred. Um, why are we still debating using gas boilers? We haven't used them for three years. Our last housing project incorporated hydrogen boilers in lieu of ASHP or the SHP. Okay, well, that's, that's obviously that's just a more of a sharing of experience for anything else, isn't it? I think that you know obviously yeah. the, the government is um, is phasing out um, gas boilers and so on in twenty twenty five. Uh, it's you know it's a very controversial move in the sense that although you know it might make to, to a sustainability person like us it may seem like you know why wouldn't you do it but actually to to move to that over a, a long period of time is a, sort of a short period of time is actually very difficult and as a result of that i think you know the plans actually are quite aggressive in terms of uh, you know phasing out gas boilers and bringing in other technologies and i think to do it any more aggressively you know would, would probably create a lot more problems um, and, and I think that, you know, we, you've got to bear in mind, this is just new build as well. And following that, there'll be a, a, a move to push that into, into retrofit and, and existing homes as well. I think, I think also, just to add on to there, that Fred's, both Fred's comments there, it ultimately is cost. Mm. You know, as we said, it's most, most of the cost things we've seen is it's almost double the cost to go for, for, for developers to go, go away from gas. And, and that's ultimately which, what drives it. Whether that's right or wrong, that is which what drives the market. Um, and in terms of yeah, future home standard, you know, why not? You could do it now if you, if you wanted to, but again, it's it's a cost thing ultimately. So if I can just hone in a little bit just on the hydrogen point too, um, mm. hydrogen is definitely a part of our future energy pic picture here 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 in the UK and right across Europe. Um, I have seen some other comments just about you know replacing natural gas etc and keeping all those uh, networks maintained um while hydrogen can be a part of the future energy picture it's not going to be the overall um silver bullet as as such it will definitely play a role um hydrogen itself there are still some challenges in terms of generating it the efficiencies relating to all of that um and there are some unanswered questions about hydrogen in people's homes etc um so it's an interesting picture moving forward with hydrogen part of it but you know there are a lot of technologies that will uh, form, form all of this so yeah right um we've got a question from peter um do you feel the gas infrastructure should still be run to new dwellings from 2025 so in the future if hydrogen boilers are viable then these customers will have access to both fuel sources I think that that'll be that'll be an economic decision as well, won't it? So, so you know, good developers could, if they're putting their source heat pumps in, decide to um, to, to run a, a mains to the uh, to, to the new built site. Uh, they probably won't, because why would they? Um, so that's one of the problems we've got is that you know, hydrogen is not available in 2025, and there's let's say a gap of I don't know two, three, or five years before it's available. You then have a lots of existing sites to which won't have access to that without significant extra costs. So again, it comes down to, you know, it comes down to cost, doesn't it? Is that right, Alex? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've got, we have got another one from Peter and he does say it might not be an easy question to answer, but um, how does the modeling in brackets SAP look for homes connected to a heat network, which can utilize various LCTs? 
Um, yeah, so the, but basically the, the, the big driver here, so SAP, um, SAP the, the new SAP, obviously the carbon emission factor for electricity was absolutely slashed. In turn, that sort of really knocked the district heating uh, networks. Um, government went away and they've set up a working group around heat networks and information has been released around how, how um, it fed, effectively put a plaster on it and, and sort of made it work. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it, you, you still will be able to tie into to district, you know, to heat networks, I guess, is the, is the simple answer. As a result, you know, at first, when it first came out, it absolutely killed them. Um, because of the changes in the in the in the SAT methodology, but um, that that effectively has been they're working on resolving that. Alex, uh, we've got another question with regards to affordability slash fuel poverty. What modelling has been done regarding running costs to compare a gas boiler to an ASHP system? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, a SAT calculations is done and it. It, an EPC is lodged from that SAP ca calculation, which gives you your EPC rating, which is linked to running cost only. So, very again, taking sort of very broad figures, rough figures, a PLC developer with a gas heated solution building to current building regs today will have a, let's say, 85B EPC. If they use gas, bolt ons, and PV, that EPC rating will go up to almost pretty much an it well will go to like a 92, 95 A rating because you've got the benefit of PV, et cetera. So you're saying that effectively the running costs will be very low. If you take all that out and put a heat pump in, although you you know you smash your carbon targets, the, the running costs actually get worse. So your EPC rating reduces and goes to into a low B, even I've seen on some house types potentially a C. So Yes, there has been a lot of work, you know, done on it, and it, and it, 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 you know, just if you just take EPC ratings, it appears that it may be, you know, it may it may be more expensive to run with a with a heat pump, and it, and it ultimately it will come down to how people live in their homes and understand the system, um, and operate that system, and I think that's the biggest challenge with SLC heat pumps. One yeah, there's, the there's, there's, challenge. There's, it is one of the biggest challenges. They do operate slightly differently. And if people don't accept that they, they run at a lower temperature and try to keep turning it up, um, it's going to cost them more money. It also comes down to the design of the system as well, because they're designed for a coefficient performance of, say, three, for example, um, you know, where, where it's designed to run very efficiently. And if it's not designed properly or we get very cold weather, they don't work as efficiently. Um, but, but also the other thing to bear in mind, of course, is at the moment, um, you know, gas has been historically quite cheap. It's a very topical at the moment. And it's been probably a third of the price of electricity. Whereas now, of course, um, you know, the price of all energy, but particularly gas disproportionately starting to increase. And there's a suggestion, actually, that, that, that over time, government will take some of the maybe some of the levies off electricity and put it onto gas if we're encouraging people to to use, say, heat pumps instead of gas boilers. So in a sense, art electricity has been artificially high. Certainly consumer electricity has been artificially high compared to gas. So, so it, there are a number of factors at play here, really, that, that means that, you know, it's hard to answer that question because it kind of depends. But generally speaking, you know, a, a gas boiler probably, with, with the other add-ons, is probably cheaper to run right now um, and, and may continue to be the case going forward. Um, but then if we're changing... To SLC pumps, maybe then there will be changes to electricity price as well as you know, obviously price of products come down, that kind of thing. You know, maybe in five years' time they'll be very cost effective to run. I think uh, I think all, uh, also on that, I would just add that some of the tariffs that can be used to actually drive down the price of utilizing that energy at a certain time and in relating into grid flexibility, etc. There is quite yeah. an evolving picture in all of this, and um, yeah, it'll be interesting in the next 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 couple of years to watch that space. Wow. Another one. With regards to either on plot battery storage or centralised or shared storage, do you foresee storing power on site as something which will assist with site managers slash reduce import demands? It will indeed. Um, what I would say is, um, first of all, uh, communal batteries are around about 40% um, more cost effective than putting individual batteries into people's homes. Um, but the business models around all of that need a little bit of movement um, with people like Bayes and Offgem, et cetera. Um, overall, 
the best solution for our distribution networks is for these upgrades to come through time. Um, but there will be uh, business models, including batteries and the use of flexibility, um, which will facilitate a period of transition and enable the distribution networks to catch up. But if I'm a house builder sitting listening in today, do I want to consider yet another um, item to purchase and put in the home? I'd probably rather have something that's going, going to um, steer loads and uh, cut down on my capex. Yeah, agree. So another one, um, how does the changes to part L affect existing buildings? You can't achieve a net zero by 2050 by just focusing on new builds. Will there be GOV support and or support from energy providers for existing building occupiers, both leasehold, flats and freeholders, houses? Yeah, there's, 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 there's this part L um, and the future standard relates just to new build. Um, I think as we might have said earlier on, this, this has really been seen as the, you know, the, 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 the thin end of the wedge, I suppose, as far as, as far as energy and homes is concerned. And they're going to start off as the sort of the flagship of new homes, I guess, as having, you know, other technologies other than fossil fuels uh, heating our homes. They're then looking at, and they're still debating on that because the heat, the, uh, the heat standards, heat strategy hasn't come out yet. They were supposed to be out in the summer. It's going to be sometime this autumn. Uh, when they're actually saying what they're going to do with with all the rest of the buildings, which obviously is you know is the is you know ninety plus percent of the buildings out there are already built. So so what they'll what they look to do is to learn from the future home standard and so on, look to roll it out. And this has been some suggestion of you know bas banning gas boilers in existing homes by twenty thirty five, which would be new ones, of course, I guess. Um, and some are saying that's a bit too aggressive, and it's been some pushback. So there's a bit of fighting going on at a political level i think as to what that's going to look like but generally speaking when you've got future home standard for new build only and um, new build homes only then they'll roll that out to new build commercial build non-domestic buildings then it will be rolled out in some way yet to be determined to all other buildings where developments with yeah where developments which have a large amount of open space or areas which cannot be residential but could support PV. Could small PV farms assist reduce import from the grid? Um, in theory, yes, but that would come back to the previous question um, that, uh, that I answered around uh, battery storage. So um, obviously PV yields are going to occur at a certain time, time during the day. And what you would need to do is take that energy, store it for use later on, et cetera. So, ties into a bigger big, bigger question um, and, and indeed business models such as PPAs, ed, et cetera, could be looked at. You're probably looking at more expensive deliveries for developers along those lines. Thanks, Denver. Um, we've got another question from Adam. So he said, this is one for Alex. Uh, would the house type dynamic simulation not be affected by orientation of plot slash sheltered sides and impact on glazed elements or has it been confirmed that this won't be factored in, i.e. a simulation per plot won't be required? Thanks. Yeah, so um, basically what, what I alluded to earlier about um, some of the PLCs, PLCs looking at sort of type approval, if you like, for overheating calcs, it is actually basing it on worst case. So worst case orientation, potentially worst case weather files. So I don't know if you take the weather file for you know, as north north of England as you can get, which, you know, will be very different to Heathrow, which I think is one of the worst ones for overheating. Um, you know, you I think developers will look to, to sort of take a worst case view on it. So no shelter from any buildings. And it's just, you know, open and, and, and a real worst case view. Um, so you don't have to go into doing site specific plot by plot dynamic simulation models, because obviously that's going to be hugely expensive. We've got one. From uh, just oh. sorry, just the, just sorry. And, and again, it comes back to some of this clarity from government around. We know there's going to be approved document. We've got some information, but it's still there's still you know the the the, the dotting of the i's and crossing of the t's still hasn't happened yet. So we we'll, we still await further detail. Thanks, Alex. Um, from Andrew, is anyone else uh, having issues with current SAP giving a false reading when using weather com compensators with the FGHR systems? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
yeah, again, I haven't got any numbers in front of me, so I'm just using very rough numbers. If you if you if you're modeling flue gas and it gives you a certain percent up, uplift and you add a weather compensator, it can jump by almost 10, 15 percent. Um, I sh I strongly feel that's not correct, that a weather compensator um wouldn't give that additional benefit. And it used to be the case that the two weren't compatible anyway, because the way flue gas work modulates the boiler and the way a weather compensator works, you're almost telling it to do the same thing. Um, so the two are, don't work together anyway. So um, I am aware developers have sort of gone ahead and assumed that it's okay in the beach software and got these great results. Um, we've sort of gone down the, we've taken it off and not included it because I, I think that will change. But again, don't know yet is the answer. Great, thanks Alex. Um, we've got another one. So what is the most economical heating and renewable energy equipment for the house builder? I think Alex has kind of answered that, haven't you, with the, um, the, the, the costing question, everyone? Yeah. Should we move on to the next question? Yeah. You might have already answered this one as well, but we'll ask it anyway. Have AES looked at the use um, of MVHR to enable gas to meet the SAP? Will a hydrogen gas mix be coming in to save the gas boiler? Gas to be switched off in 2025 to new homes? Really? Question mark. <laughs> um, hi, Jason. I know Jason. So I can, I can picture him even saying this to me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, we have looked at MVHR alongside all the other technologies. You know, it's in the mix. It can be done, but it comes with all its usual um, things around ducting and the cost of an MVHR unit, and changing the filters and all the stuff that normally comes up. Um, I'm not a specialist on hydrogen, but as I understand it, it's a long, long way off. So I wouldn't be banking that it's going to be coming in in 2025 to save the gas boiler. Um, I, I can pretty much <laughs> say that. I'm, I think Dem would probably be able to answer that bit better. And what was the last bit of the question? Or was that the last bit of the question? That was really the last bit of the question. It was... Yeah. Um... So, so, so just to... Yeah, MVHR, it's in the mix. It, it can, you know, you go down to lower air leakage. You can, you can effectively take out other technologies or, you know, reduce PV or take the wastewater out. You know, it's in the, it's in the mix for you to, to look at in, in the recipe if it, if it works for you. And then, and then you, uh, you're looking at a, a maximum of about 20% 20, uh, 20 injection of hydrogen into uh, natural gas. So, um, yeah, until hydrogen is fully available and everything's scoped out and the efficiencies and everything, yeah, there are a lot of question marks there. Thanks, guys. Um, we've got another one from Fred. I'm not sure if this is a question... Um, it might be an answer to something we mentioned earlier. Um, he said, we are offering to supply future home standard compliant units to public sector clients now, but there's still no appetite for this before the government makes it mandatory. We will be stuck with another five years of new housing that will require retrofitting. I'm not sure if anyone has anything. No. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good point. Um, and I think that you're right. There's, there's, you know, there's a, a program to go through here. I think, but um, I think there's, there, there is a um, an expectation, and certainly it's a good thing. I think that the public sector are going above and beyond. So, you know, if we're building social housing or we're building I don't know, government buildings, hospitals, whatever, I think that you know it's a good thing that, that government or public sector generally have got an appetite to to to, to show the way, if you like, and to, um, to 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 go above and beyond what they need to do. And I don't think that's a, that's that's a bad thing. I think that should be encouraged, and we can obviously learn lessons from that. And that's always starts the process off. Um, I, I think that the um, you know the, the program that's in place for for new build housing developers generally across the board, you know, building two hundred and plus hundred thousand thousand houses across the UK at the moment, looking to go towards three hundred thousand. I think that's still quite ambitious. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we, yes, it's great to go faster, but, you know, if we try and go too fast, then we mess it up and fall over, don't we? So I think that um, I, I personally think, and I don't say this very often, I think the government's probably got it about right. <laughs> I think this might be one of our last questions. We might have another one in the chat for you, Alex. But 
From Jason again, um, do you see PV costs to fall down in price, even with the demand more, even more with the demand going up? Sorry, the expensive cost is the inverter, I believe. I think I think that's 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 an interesting debate because the, the price of PV has obviously plummeted over the last uh, last ten or twelve years by about you know eighty percent. Um, not just the PV panels, but also the inverters and, and just the cost of installation. You know, I think we've got a lot better at it. If something would have taken us a two days or a day now takes us, you know, a couple of hours to install um, as, as a, an experienced installer. Um, those prices will continue to drop over the long term, I think, um, as, as the price of the of technology tends to. Uh, and, and I guess over time, then, then, you know, when there's 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 more being installed, then, you know, the experience will be gained. So it will tend to bring costs down over a period of time. That said, I think that, you know, the fast cost reductions we've seen in the past and, you know, are not going to happen. You can't continue to drop at that sort of rate. And in the short term, I think, you know, with what's going on um, with, you know, with the, the, that kind of perfect storm of Brexit, COVID, um, you know, problems in the Suez Canal, all sorts of things going on. I think that, you know, the chances are the prices won't drop. They might actually increase a little bit in the short term. And the, the inverters actually have come down in price a heck of a lot. And they're not, they're now not a major cost actually in the, the cost of an installation. They're actually, um, um, you know, a fairly small part. But that said, they're, they're that small, you know, that even a, a significant reduction in the price of inverters wouldn't bring the cost of a, I don't know, a four kilowatt system down by very much. So I think the answer is we're going to see a plateauing of, uh, of cost, maybe a little bit of a rise before it slowly starts to dip again over the long term. Would you agree, Ryan? Yeah, definitely. You've got, like I said in the um, in the slides, the um, demand exceeding supply will only send the prices one way. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's probably the first time this year that we've actually started to see price increases on PV panels, whereas historically it has come down, as Paul has said. So, yeah, if um, if we do it and we ramp up slowly, then you can you can forecast, you can buy panels in, you know, months in advance. Developers may choose to buy and secure stock, you know, and, and pay for it themselves, which has been done before, to ensure they've got the stock and that you get a, a better price. But if everything goes back to you know everybody doing everything at once. There's going to be a scramble for anything that's available and it takes you know four months to come from china um then yeah i can't see the prices coming down at all but is it also it's, a, it's an issue right across the board because you take the gas solution with flue gas wastewater pv if everyone goes to market in june 20 get as many plots as you can before june 23 and then hit june 23 wanting wastewater pv it, it's just going to be so difficult yeah. for the supply chain to, to be able to deal with it. Um, so yeah, I think that that's that's one of the big issues around. Yes, as as more units of anything are made, the cost will come down, but it's actually obtaining the, the and working with your supply chain to make sure it's actually there. Yeah, and that, that's the conundrum, isn't it? That, that that you know over over time, you know, increased volume leads to economies of scale and brings the price down, brings more. It brings more entrance to the market. It means that people find, you know, cheaper and better ways of doing things. But on, on, in the short term, if you get sudden increases in demand, then the law of, you know, supply and demand applies. And suddenly you've got, you know, if demand mm. is, is greater than supply, then the price goes up. So it's another example, really, if we, if we can if we can manage that growth so it's sustainable over a period of time, then we can probably keep prices more stable and or bring them down over the over the sort of medium term. On the other hand, if there's big spikes, then it tends to increase the price. So it's it's really is about managing this this process of change. And you know, change management is a is a significant part of any um, of any project, isn't it? So so I'll just say that in uh, Scotland, uh, when the building regs changed change back in 20, 2015, I think um, there was an increase in the supply of uh, or, or the demand rather for heat pumps, etc., as well as uh, solar. And indeed, some of the manufacturers struggled, struggled to keep up with um, demand at that point. So I think that just reinforces what you're saying, Paul. That's great. Thanks, guys. Um, we've got a question for Alex. Um, so would the house type dynamic simulation not be affected by... Have we had this one already? Yeah, I have, one. Oh, have we? Yeah, yeah, I think it's been asked in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> I think that might be it then. Uh... Oh, I think Edward has asked, will there be a copy of this webinar sent around? Um, yes, there will be. So probably early next week, we'll send around an email to everyone who attended 
um, with a copy of the webinar so people can watch it. Yeah, but I think that's all the questions asked, guys. So thank you so, so much for um, joining us today. Um, it's been so insightful for everyone and we've had really great questions and a great event. So um, if anyone wants to get in touch with um, Eco to Solar or AES or E.ON, uh, please do let us know and uh, we hope to speak to people soon. And there is um, a little survey, I think, just after this when people um, leave the webinar, which it would be appreciated if people could just answer their questions. It's only about three questions, though. That would be really appreciated if possible. Yeah, and we'd appreciate it. if anybody needs any help. That's that's true of all four of us, really. Just please get in touch. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.